Good afternoon. It is Thursday and it is 1.51 in the afternoon. And I'm coming to you here with the last lecture. And this one is going to be on reconstruction. And really, this is just going to be what's going on after the Civil War ends. If you watched the last lecture, you know Civil War ends, the North wins, the South loses, blah, blah, blah. But a lot of people don't really look at how the country's put back together. And that's really what I want to do right here. So first of all, even before the war is over, the United States government is going to have to start planning for what to do when the war is over. And both Abraham Lincoln and the Congress, or the, the legislative branch, I should say, are going to put together two competing plans. Lincoln's plan is known as the Proclamation of Amnesty and Reconstruction. And it's better known really as the 10% plan. And the reason it's called the 10% plan is Abraham Lincoln wanted to go and find all the voters who voted in the 1860 presidential election and then get 10% of that number to pledge allegiance to the United States. And that's going to be for the Southern territories. Once that 10% takes the oath of allegiance and once that 10% uh, agrees to end slavery through emancipation, then that minority group will be allowed to create a new state government. The other catch with Lincoln's plan is that uh, no Confederate officials would be allowed to serve in the new government and no military officers would be allowed to serve in the government. Uh, Lincoln, by the way, as we already know, he's not really big on uh, equal rights. Uh, he did not write into his plan anything about uh, African Americans or black voting. Uh, the Wade Davis bill, which is what's going to be proposed by uh, Senator Benjamin Wade and uh, Congressman Henry Davis, is not 10%, it's 50%. What they want to do is go to all the southern states, find all the people who voted in 1860, and then have half of those voters pledge allegiance to the flag and approve the ending of slavery. Much more difficult. Once that 50% is found, then delegates would be elected to create a new state constitution. Once that new state constitution includes uh, procedures that ban secession and ban slavery, Congress could approve them, and only then could a new state government begin. And to add on to that, like almost a cherry on top, any voter who says that they'll take the oath of allegiance they have to give a secondary oath that was known as the ironclad oath that says that they never supported the Confederacy. Now the problem with that is they don't really define what that means. So supporting the Confederacy could be serving as an officer, serving as a soldier, sending money. The way it was written it could have just been giving a soldier socks. So it's written to be ambiguous and it's written to be difficult on purpose. And the Wade Davis bill, no black voting there either. Now at the end, Lincoln refuses to sign the Wade Davis bill. And Congress refuses to pass Lincoln's proclamation of amnesty and reconstruction. So we have zero plans because both plans are, are thrown out. And when Lincoln dies in April of 1865, there is actually no plan whatsoever on how to put the country back together. Now, as early as 1863, this becomes a question, and the proclamation, or the Emancipation Proclamation of Lincoln is going to be what really changes the war from a war to preserve the Union to a war that ends slavery. There's no idea of who is going to be in charge of this emancipation, who's going to pay for it. Um, some people say the army should do it, but in reality, the army, they just have enough supplies for themselves, and they're moving from place to place and can't stay and protect anybody. Uh, some people say the U.S. Treasury, but the U.S. Treasury, um, you know, their main job is to collect tax revenue and spend tax revenue. They're not equipped or ready to take care of large numbers of people. Well, if that's the case, if it can't be the government, <clears throat> what about our, our um, private men? Uh, you got private businessmen. You've got private missionaries. You got private, private freedmen's groups. 
Well, businessmen are going to look for a way to make money. Uh, missionaries, you know, they're involved in church. And then freedmen groups might be looked down on and, um, you know, have a hard time operating in the South. So when it comes down to it, the U.S. Army, they can only help for a short amount of time. They can basically give them a warm meal and maybe a blanket, and then they're going to move on. The Treasury agents, uh, they want to get people back to work because they want tax money and tax revenue. And then the private businessmen, they're looking out for their own. They've taken over leases on farms, they've acquired land, and they want these former slaves to provide work. And really, whether it's the army, the treasury, the private businessmen, they all are looking for labor and somebody to continue doing the work. Now, what about the actual slaves themselves? What happens when they get their, their freedom? Well, um, they may not necessarily know what freedom means. Uh, they have these preconceived notions of freedom, but they have never experienced it, so they don't really know what it means fully. Uh, typically speaking, though, the first steps, they have to decide, you know, where are we going to live? Are we going to stay where we are now? Are we going to move around? Are we going to go north? Are we going to move west? Are we going to take our entire family? Are we going to look for our family members? Because remember, these families, they don't stay together. They get sold. So do we stay put and wait for aunt and uncle to show up? Do we go off looking for our kids? What do we do then? Uh, they even have to think about what they're going to do for a living. Uh, are they going to stay as a field hand? Are they going to stay in domestic service? Are they going to go and try and you know, work in an industry? And then last but not least, you know, is there somebody out there that can help us? Is the government going to help us? Is there a church that's going to help us? Things like that. Um, most of the assistance that the former slaves got, it's from something called the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, better, uh, the official term is the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. But the Freedmen's Bureau is what it becomes known as. <clears throat> and the job of the Freedmen's Bureau, they're going to give food and clothing and some legal assistance to these former slaves. They're also going to provide medical care and education. Uh, you might ask, why legal assistance? The Freedmen's Bureau was trying to make sure that these former slaves did not sign unequal agreements or unequal contracts. Uh, for the missionaries, uh, missionary societies are going to set up schools for former slaves and these schools are going to provide a sense of community they're going to give some sort of social hierarchy meaning that they're going to develop leaders for um, black culture and black uh, communities and then just sunday school education teaching these former slaves and the children of former slaves how to read and write Very often, the job that the former slave did is the same job or very similar to the to the job that they'd held while they were a slave. Um, if they worked in a field prior to being free, they probably worked in a field after being free. If they worked as a domestic servant before, they're going to probably be a domestic servant after. And it's not because they're forced to do that. It's quite simply, it's what they know. Uh, the biggest difference... <clears throat> the the former slave is now receiving a paycheck, even if it is small, and they're having to now pay for their own living experience, you know, whether that's food or clothing or shelter, wherever it might be. So uh, they're doing the same job. They're getting a small paycheck, but they're still coming out with nothing because every penny they make is being paid out. In many places in the South, it becomes illegal to be unemployed. Um, Vagrancy and unemployment are labeled crimes, and you could actually be arrested for being a vagrant, meaning no place to live, and you could be arrested for being homeless, too. <clears throat> These are very often known as black codes. Now, I have to say, uh, black codes, you may not have heard of them, um, but they are a big part of what happens in the 1860s in the South. Uh, they are not connected with the better known Jim Crow laws. So if you do see a question on the test about Jim Crow or black codes, just know that black codes are the answer. Jim Crow is not. 
Why? Because Jim Crow doesn't become a thing until the 1890s. So this is 20 years plus before that time. Now, what are black codes? Like I said, it's illegal to be unemployed. It's illegal to be a vagrant. If you are found to be a vagrant, if you're found to be unemployed, you have to pay a fine or you have to go to jail. Uh, these former slaves cannot pay a fine. They cannot pay bail, so they sit in jail. But you know who does have money? The former slave owner. So the former slave owner will bond out the former slave. The former slave owner will put the former slave back to work. And that former slave must work until their fees are paid off. Some other black codes are going to restrict your movement. Sometimes you can't enter a town, but very often you can't leave town either. Basically, the former slave owners want their former slaves to be close by. In some black codes, uh, African Americans are forbidden from owning land, they're forbidden from renting land. And you might say, wait a minute, but if they can't own land or rent land, how are they supposed to not be a vagrant? That's kind of the point. Uh, it's also legal to break a contract. It's illegal to assemble in large numbers, which by the way meant more than three. And it was illegal to insult a white person. And that was interpreted very, very frequently and very, um, um, there was a lot of flexibility with that one. This guy right here is President Andrew Johnson. And Andrew Johnson is Lincoln's second vice president. Uh, Lincoln had a different vice president for his first term than he did his second term. And in his second term, Abraham Lincoln, who was a Republican, chose as his vice president a Democrat from Tennessee. If that's confusing, it is confusing. But Lincoln never ran for president as a Republican. And a lot of people are shocked by that. In his second term, he runs for president on a unity ticket where Lincoln chooses Andrew Johnson, who is a Democrat from Tennessee. Now, if you're curious why, Lincoln did this for political reasons. When it comes down to it, he is a political figure. Lincoln thought if he chose Andrew Johnson, that the Southern states would realize Lincoln's not trying to punish the South. He's chosen a South as his, a Southerner as his right-hand man, and they'd be more likely to give up and surrender. Once Lincoln is shot in Ford's theater and dies the next morning, Andrew Johnson becomes a president. And Andrew Johnson, being a Southern Democrat from Tennessee, he thinks the South is perfectly fine. And when Congress passes the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and the Freedmen's Bureau Act, Johnson's going to veto both of those. Well, as punishment for this, Congress is going to impeach Andrew Johnson. They accuse him of high crimes and misdemeanors, and they're going to impeach Johnson. Now, if you're curious what they accuse Johnson of doing, uh, it's kind of shady. Uh, Congress is going to pass a law that says that uh, Andrew Johnson cannot hire or fire any of his cabinet members without congressional approval. If you read the Constitution, there are only a certain number of things that are guaranteed by the president. One of those is that he can appoint and remove his or her own uh, congressional, or not congressional, but cabinet members. Johnson knew this was illegal, and Johnson purposely fired the Secretary of War. Well, because Congress didn't like Johnson, they found enough votes to accuse him of high crimes and misdemeanors and they impeached him, he went on trial. And Johnson retains the presidency by one vote. You have to have two thirds to convict and impeach or to convict after an impeachment. And Johnson was one vote shy of that. Regardless though, the radical Republicans are gonna win the election of 1866 and this reconstruction is going to change. It's going to become a reconstruction built on uh, punishment and retribution instead of just togetherness. Congress is going to pass the Radical Reconstruction Act of 1867. And what it did is it got rid of all of the state governments in the South, except for Tennessee, which was a courtesy to the president. 
five military districts are going to be created throughout the South, and those five military districts will have a military governor and be led by the military. Before civilian state governments could come back again, new state governments had to be rewritten, and these new state governments had to guarantee black voting rights. Also, uh, during 1867, the Freedmen's Bureau is going to be refinanced, meaning it is given more money to operate, and there is no Democratic Party in the South. Um, Republicans are going to dominate the South from basically 1865 to 1871, maybe even 1873. Now, why is that? It's not because suddenly the Republicans are popular in the South. It's because so many white voters are prohibited from voting. There's so much disenfranchisement going on in the late 1860s that Republicans are able to take control of state governments. Now, if you are somebody who at all pays attention to politics, you might say, wait a minute, Republicans run the South now? This is true, but that's a new phenomenon. From basically 1873 all the way up until the 1980s, every state in the South was solidly Democratic, including their governor, their legislature, and their votes for president. Not everybody appreciates Reconstruction. There are political attacks. Um, just like there's political attacks today, there are political attacks, and they're all based on uh, money and race. There are actual physical attacks. Uh, the red shirts, they want the Democratic Party to come to power in the South. And then very famously, the KKK, it becomes a violent social fraternity. Um, and the KKK, it's pretty much equal opportunity hate. They hate black voters, white Republicans. They hate union leaders. They hate freedmen bureaus, agents. They hate anybody who's helping uh, African-Americans vote or sign up to vote, you name it. Well, in the early 1870s, Congress is going to pass the KKK Act and the Enforcement Act. And that officially outlawed Klan violence, but it didn't matter because by 1873, um, the Democratic Party is back in full control in the South, and the Democratic Party is going to try and sweep these the idea of African-American equality under the rug. Last but not least, three Reconstruction Era amendments you have to know. Uh, the 13th Amendment is the one that ends slavery. So 13th Amendment ends slavery, and that's ratified December 6th, 1865. The 14th Amendment, that is what allows for black citizenship. The 14th Amendment ratified July 9th, 1868 is what undoes the Dred Scott decision. And then finally, the 15th Amendment, which is from the 26th of February, 1869, that's what gives all males the right to vote, regardless of skin color or previous servitude or anything else. If you are a male and you are an American citizen, you can vote as of February 26, 1869. Uh, women, you won't get to vote till 1920, and then um, Native Americans won't get to vote until later in the 1920s. Sorry. All right. So that is everything that you need to know for the class. Hopefully you've watched all these videos and you're doing well with your study. But if you're not, let me give you a couple of things that are going to be on the, the final exam. So what we have I have here a list of topics that are going to be on the final exam. Uh, what I want you to go back and look at is the moral economy and the market economy. What was the moral economy and why did it change to the market economy? Why did Martha Ballard become Eli Whitney? Remember Martha Ballard was the, the woman from Maine who was also a midwife and she kept the diary that told us what the moral economy was. Eli Whitney, 
Uh, he is the inventor who invented the cotton gin. He invented the idea of replaceable parts, and he ushered in the early industrialization period. Got true womanhood. That is where women worked in early textile mills, and true womanhood was the reaction to it. True womanhood is the idea of um, you know women teaching religion and teaching uh, early kids and in those publications that I talked about as well. So make sure you go back and you review True Womanhood. We got the idea of northern urbanization. That was where um, the, the anti-slavery movement start to expand. You got the Second Great Awakening in there with Charles Finney and the utopian movements of the Mormons and the, the Romanticism. Uh, so go back and look at that. Uh, for Southern society, uh, make sure that you pay attention to what slave culture was like, uh, who the slave revolts were led by, um, the social hierarchy in the white South as well. Also, the election of 1824 with Andrew Jackson. Um, just remember that Andrew Jackson had several scandals that were surrounding him, the Peggy Eaton affair, the, the species circular affair and a couple others. Uh, go back and review Bleeding Kansas, where Kansas wanted to become a state and you had the idea of popular sovereignty where people were going to vote whether they wanted slavery or not. And uh, Manifest Destiny, God said go west. And that's how the Mexican-American War happens and that's how the California Gold Rush happens, etc, etc. And then last but not least, the election of 1860 all the way up to the Civil War. Who were the people who were in the election of 1860? Why did the Civil War happen? What was the reaction in the South when Lincoln was elected? Spoiler alert, it was the, uh, the secession of the states, the creation of the uh, Confederate States of America. What order are the armies built? Remember, there's the deciding how to fight, there's the uh, the oh what did I call it um you have to decide if you want to fight you have to um enlist then you have to muster out then get trained and then um or you know get supplied and then last but not least get trained so the the order of building those armies during the civil war and then remember the end of the Civil War, what happens there with Sherman's march to the sea and and um, Lee being caught in Virginia by Grant, and then what happens afterwards. Uh, so make sure you watch these videos. Make sure that you go back and you look at any notes you took. Make sure you look at the, the, the slideshows I provided for you. If you do those things and you take the final seriously, you're going to do perfectly fine. I can almost guarantee it. So um, if you do watch this and you have any questions about a particular topic, just send me an email and I am more than happy to answer that. As far as the actual final exam itself, it does open up on Friday the 21st and it will be open um, until that next Thursday night. So make sure that you uh, take some time to do that. It's not proctored. You don't have to use respondents. So just make sure that you log in when you have, you know, an hour to an hour and a half to just sit quietly and take that test. All right. It's been a pleasure. I hate that I couldn't meet any of you in person, but maybe I'll do that in the future. If you're ever on the Carrollton campus, just stop by and say hi, and I'd love to meet you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.